pleased to have with us Adam Mel Miller, who's one of the key folks on the OpenShift Online team. He's an OpenShift release engineer on top of doing all kinds of good work on the behind the scenes, keeping OpenShift um, up and running um, and being part of the OpenShift operations team. And what I asked him to talk about a little bit today is uh, the idea and the, the way we do DevOps at OpenShift Online. And I'm gonna let him take it away and we'll record this. And if you uh, need to, we'll be able, you'll be able to play it back um, at any time at your leisure. So Adam, with that, you wanna take it away? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so, with uh, with OpenShift Commons, we're we, you know we're very excited to be a part of the community and, and be sharing uh, some of our lessons learned and hopefully uh, you know hear from others and and kind of collaborate on those kinds of things. One of the things we want to discuss was uh, the process by which we work with the developers and work with Upstream and how um, everything makes its way into um, OpenShift Online uh, out of production. So uh, what we'll go ahead and cover in this session is how OpenShift Online consumes Origin, how the online team contributes to Origin, and how code goes from development environments into production. Um, kind of the process by, by which that occurs, and um, just kind of get an idea of, of how uh, everything works. So, however, we, you know, before we get down that road, you know, the title of the talk mentioned DevOps and uh, DevOps is one of those terms that are very overloaded. Uh, it will change depending on who you ask. Uh, I tend to like to default to the definition that is found on Wikipedia, which I paraphrased here. Uh, it's a software development method that stresses communication, collaboration, and integration between the dev team and the operations team. And we, we believe that in a, a lot of ways that increases um, efficiency, it helps your workflow, um, and it can really kind of tear down barriers where in uh, what I'll call a classic environment, a lot of times the dev, te dev team would just write something and kind of throw it over the fence. The operations team has to figure out how to run it. Um, and if, uh, you know, if the two teams are collaborating along the way and discussing uh, and voicing one of those concerns so they can be taken into consideration, uh, it, it, it helps in a lot of ways. Uh, so. Um, <clears throat> Moving from there, uh, how code flows uh, in OpenShift. Uh, this is probably a diagram most people have seen. If not, um, this is how the OpenShift project and products are structured. OpenShift origin is upstream. All the code is upstream first. Anything that goes into either the online or the enterprise product is upstream first. Uh, open source is very near and dear to uh, our hearts on our team. Uh, we, you know, we live and breathe it, and it's very near and dear to Red Hat. We continue that tradition uh, in the OpenShift line. Um, so all the code is upstream first, and anything that comes downstream from there um, is you know, potentially shared back and forth between online and enterprise. Uh, we have different release cadences. Uh, online, we release to production every three weeks, whereas enterprise, I believe, uh, averages about every six months-ish. Um, release cycle. Enterprise releases, you know, when they're ready. ready. With online, we have planned releases, and if features aren't ready, they just get cut. Um, so we kind of have different uh, life cycle uh, cadences, but um, all of the code is always upstream first, and you'll probably hear me iterate on that uh, point and, and kind of hammer that home a little bit more uh, as I talk through some other points. So I wanted to go over the architecture of OpenShift uh, because as we move through uh, the rest of the presentation, I'm going to talk about development environments, which we refer to as DevEmps. And a DevEmp is a single host. It's a, a one machine, all-inclusive uh, OpenShift environment. It's running every component of OpenShift on a single virtual machine uh, that's run uh, for our purposes, for online, it's run out in EC2, but it could be run uh, anywhere, really. So inside of that development environment or that DevEmp, we have uh, our, our Mongo storage, we have our authentication component, we have our DNS, and then the broker, uh, which you'll see uh, at, the, at the top, the broker is kind of the orchestration component. It is the, the point in which everything uh, is keyed off of. Um, so when the client 
whether they're using the RHC command line tools or IDE integrations or the web interface, makes a REST API call into the broker. The broker then will go through and uh, check authentication, um, make sure that you are who you say you are and your permissions to do what you um, want to do. Uh, it will then um, send a message over the M Collective message, uh, messaging interface to schedule whatever task you need done, uh, and that will communicate over to the node um, the, the actual task to be accomplished. And the nodes, uh, in a traditional environment, you would normally have a lot of nodes, uh, but for the sake of development, you can run that component on the same host and just run your gears there locally. Uh, so over in Collective, it'll tell the node to, let's just say, for example, create a gear. Um, it will then uh, send that message over in Collective. The node will receive that message. The node will then uh, go ahead and set up that gear as it was requested. And from there, the node can accept uh, Git pushes from the client and then also uh, web requests from the rest of the world. Um, and as that application is being created, the broker also uh, goes through and stores uh, metadata in the Mongo database and also uh, sets up your DNS entry. So all of these components, uh, all of these different uh, pieces all running together on uh, one machine uh, is, is the DevEnf. And, and it's for you know, the, the use case of having a fully functional OpenShift environment on a single host that you can uh, use as a point uh, to start development on top of if you want to uh, hack on OpenShift, the platform itself. Um, or uh, it's also useful for developing cartridges and, and things of that nature. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, we, we create these uh, automatically. Uh, we have a Jenkins uh, server out there that will actually orchestrate all this develop, all of the dev and creation, uh, it, we queue them off based on new git commits to master that have been merged. Uh, we queue them off of uh, new updates to the base image. Uh, so we have a clean OS uh, that's relic or Fedora um, that we go ahead and, um, well actually we've also uh, since, um, since CentOS has joined the you know greater Red Hat family, we've also added CentOS to the mix. Uh, so we have our base AMI, and for those who don't know, AMI uh, is the uh, the image format for uh, Amazon uh, EC2. So we have our AMI, and um, we register that with EC2 to launch instances. Uh, from there, Jenkins will will spawn a task and actually run a build, and the build will go out and it will build the entire OpenShift platform from source into our PM, and then uh, do that installation. Um, onto the environment, and then we have a, a large number of post-install post -install procedures that are done to actually set up the environment, so register things, and um, set up a, a demo, like a demo user with some authentication, things like that. Uh, <clears throat> set up some quotas for that user so they can actually go in and start creating gears. Um, and then that image is then re-registered again so that at any point in time, one of the developers would like to, they can spawn a new development environment and get the latest build with all the latest updates. So <clears throat> the build workflow is Jenkins will clone the master branch from OpenShift. Um, they will then launch the base AMI and we use that base AMI to build the new demo. Uh, and then, <clears throat> uh, like I said earlier, it will do the, um, or I'm sorry, it will then synchronize the code up to the dev app, and then as I mentioned before, it will build the RPMs from source, create a local yum repository, and it will yum install all of the RPMs from there, and then do the post install tasks. Uh, very similarly to how somebody would uh, install OpenShift themselves uh, from a, a yum repository. Um, however, from there, it will also run through a number of uh, unit tests, rate tests, Cucumber, if anybody's familiar with the, the Cucumber testing framework. Uh, it will run all these tests and report results, uh, so that way only known good uh, images are registered for uh, developers to launch as development environments. Um, 
That is mostly because if in the event one of these builds is kicked off from a merge into master and somehow uh, somebody got a bad commit in, um, because as much as we have bots and testing, if if one of the few people who has the permissions to just merge things uh, does so, or um, maybe some something new got merged in that just doesn't have a test case uh, in the merge uh, testing, uh, just if it sneaks in and something happens, uh, these tests are done to make sure that uh, the development environments are in a known good state, so that when developers launch one and start their te their development, uh, we're not uh, giving them something that's already broken. <clears throat> From there, how development happens is a developer will go ahead and clone onto their local machine the code from GitHub, from OpenShift Origin, and then they will uh, launch a development environment and synchronize the code from their local uh, branch. Uh, and we say local branch because our development workflow is if you want to add a feature or create a topic, um, or I'm sorry, a, add a new um, user story or something like that, you create a topic branch. We call them topic branches. And you do your development there locally in that branch in Git. Uh, well, you can synchronize your local branches up to the dev amp that you've launched. Uh, and then the the dev inf will, on synchronization, actually run an RPM build and create that local YAML repository and do the install with your new packages and do an upgrade task. Uh, and then from there, um, the developer can run all of these rake tests, or they can run a limited set. Let's say you're working on a node feature and you wanted to just run the node tests. Um, and there's also a set of node extended tests. You can do that. Um, so that would be kind of the developer workflow. From there, um, the developer would put in a pull request upstream uh, onto GitHub, and then somebody would tag it uh, with the literal open, bra open bracket, the word merge, close bracket. That would be the comment. Uh, it would have to be by somebody who has the permissions to kick off a merge task. Uh, and those are normally just developers who've been with the OpenShift project long enough to uh, have been granted that permission. Uh, and are you know trusted to be uh, to be uh, doing that sort of thing. So after it's been through code review, somebody will tag it with merge, uh, and then the um, OpenShift bot, which we call Rosie, which is why there's a picture of Rosie from the Jetsons, who uh, remembers that. Um, so Rosie will go out and grab that commit, uh, clone it locally in a Jenkins job, uh, merge that new patch locally, synchronize it up to a, a completely different, disparate, brand new, pristine development environment, uh, and then run it through the same round of testing that uh, it should have gone through on the developer side, but we, we run it through those tests again just to ensure that, uh, or to do our due diligence that bad commits don't need to master. So from there, it will go through, and uh, if it passes those tests, it will be merged into upstream and is now a master. So <clears throat> once all of the, uh, the code has been committed into master, we have all our features in, uh, we need to get into deployment. So for the operations side of the house, what we do is uh, every day after the first week of the sprint, we do, or I'm sorry, after the first four days of the sprint, we do uh, deployment from RPM package sets. We will actually farm out RPM builds into our internal build system. Um, if anybody's familiar with uh, Koji from the Fedora project, our internal build system is, is based on Koji. Um, we'll, we'll send into our build system, and then uh, we'll create our, our YAML repository, and we'll do deployments. We do full deployments with all of our, our Ansible and Puppet uh, tooling, and I, I try to mention both of them because we do use both of them. They are both uh, uh, very useful. Uh, Puppet is great for configuration management. Uh, Ansible is great for uh, certain deployment in order uh, task execution. Uh, so uh, we use them together. I know a lot of people try to kind of, well, in a lot of conversations I have, a lot of people try to compare them um, directly to one another or, or consider them as competing technologies. Uh, we find that using them together is very useful. Um, and, and just using 
the I guess for us it's tool for the job kind of thing. Uh, so uh, we have we do have public configuration out in uh, Oach, or, um, uh, Origin project. Uh, we have uh, Puppet uh, manifests and, and things that people can actually use to deploy Object Origin uh, themselves. Uh, we have some uh, some Ansible orchestration stuff that we're also working on uh, that's out on on GitHub as well. If anyone wants to go look at that, um, a lot of the, a lot of the Ansible stuff I will admit though is for uh, Ocean V3, um, which is uh, not yet ready for prime time, but um, it's all up there. So please you know check it out, give us feedback, uh, that sort of thing. But anyways, um, so <clears throat> we will do these deployments every day to integration, and then our QE team will actually go through and test it every day and provide feedback, and the developers get, um, you know, their their bugs and their their um, just testing reports and things like that from the QE team. They'll fix everything, and um, then every spring cycle we have a stage day and we cut to stage and we actually do a branch in uh, in the uh, GitHub, GitHub repositories and the one thing I like to, to mention is this diagram uh, out down at the bottom that has ownership origin and has a line and then uh, there's kind of a line that breaks off and that's our stage branch and, and that's to show that at some point we basically clone the code and deviate now from what is happening master. However, any time that any fix is going to stage, it is upstreamed into origin first because, I'm sorry, upstreamed into master first because master is supposed to never stop moving. Uh, that is where continued development is going to always happen. Um, it's just that we have to, we have to hit pause at some point and make sure that what we have is good before we do deployments. Uh, so what we will do is we have these RPM package sets that once they've made it into stage, uh, and once we've done these deployments there, um, they, they're they no longer like fresh builds. They, they instead of what we call graduate, um, just for lack of a better term. So they graduate from integration to staging, and then again, they graduate from staging to production once they've passed once all they've the criteria all the to label it as such. We do all of our once once they've graduated in production. We do all of our RPM signing to you know once we do our deployments, we can do audits and things like that in production to verify that all the code out there and you know is number one from us and number two is you know exactly what we expect to be there. <clears throat> and then uh, once we get deployed, uh, that's what's running in production. That's what's at openshift.com. That's what you know when you do a deployment out there uh, using the you know, the platform itself yeah, the platform to itself. launch your web app, your development environment uh, for you know, your, I don't know, PHP or Node.js application, uh, pick your poison, It's uh, that's what's running out there. So, what does our environment look like? <clears throat> in, in EC2, we have our REST API that hides behind actually two, uh, two layers of load balancers, and we do that for a number of of reasons, but some of it is um, uh, just ease of automation. But so we have, uh, we mentioned before that we were hosted in EC2, so we use a, an EC2 elastic load balancer, and we have uh, multiple HA proxy instances that sit behind the elastic load balancer, uh, and then we can actually rotate those in and out as we need to. And um, <clears throat> One thing to note is actually we have uh, load balancers, the mix that are running uh, RHEL 7 um, uh, atomic host beta. Uh, we, because of the fact that it's all hiding behind the ELB and we can load balance across them, we, we wanted to uh, start demoing some of that newer technology and, and that's how we do it is we find, we find points uh, in the system that are, are highly redundant and we can, we can rotate in a more experimental component, and if we need to, we'll move it out. Uh, so I, just, I like to mention that because that's kind of an interesting topic uh, that's that's been coming up lately with uh, the atomic host and, and Docker and everything. So we one of one of our load balancers uh, in in production is actually running uh, through Docker on RHEL 7 atomic beta. Um, just the fun fact of the day. So. Uh, from there, we uh, we have a set of brokers. I have two in the diagram. Uh, we actually run uh, four in production. 
Uh, from there, Mongo, a lot of people will ask when, when we're presenting at conferences or at tech meetups, uh, what are we doing to tune Mongo? How do we handle you know, the load or the transactions that we get uh, in a production environment as big as OpenShift Online uh, with Mongo? And you know, the, the question about tuning and, and sharding and, and all those things, uh, the answer is we don't. Um, that we have a standard Torino repl replica set. Uh, it has been performant enough for what we do with it uh, that we haven't we haven't had to. We do some indexing of of certain uh, collections, but uh, that's about it. We don't you know we don't have any sharding. We don't have uh, a very um, uh, exotic configuration. It's it's pretty standard. Um, so just for anybody you know running this internally or or you know on if they have any plans to. Uh, deploy OpenShift. The three node replica set serves serves you very well. Um, so in online from there, our brokers uh, will call out to. We have a DNS cloud provider. We actually don't host our own DNS. Uh, we have a third party uh, provider. Um, and one thing I'd like to note is with online, all of all of our code uh, that we use is, is either open source or uh, we work on getting open source. So one of the things are DNS plugin. Uh, that one uh, is now up in GitHub uh, for a while. Uh, it was internal only because of something. I don't. I, I honestly uh, don't know. I'm sure legal or, or something of that sort. But um, you know, the work was done to actually get that to be open source. So um, it is now. So everything online that is not, it's only extensions. We it's only a plugin or an extension. It's never a core component that we add features to and just keep it inside. It's it's always you know it's always just kind of a, an add-on component that uh, is is set the way it is for now. And then you know so a prime example of that is single sign-on. So internally, Red Hat has a single sign-on service. Uh, it was written in-house. It was homegrown. Um, there, there's not a whole lot of motivation to go through the, you know, the process of getting the approval to open source the plugin for that single sign-on that was written in-house because nobody else is going to be running that, so it wouldn't be very useful for anybody else. But um, it is just a plugin for anybody who who is familiar with the authentication component of OpenShift. Uh, it's it's just in the plugins directory. Um, we throw it in there. We add a config, and it, it loads. If we were to take it out, it would be the same. Um, so, so our DNS is a cloud provider. Our single sign-on, as I mentioned, was an in-house. Um, from there, the broker will uh, talk M Collective. Uh, M Collective talks uh, online. Our backend for M Collective is the Active MQ uh, message queue. Uh, so we have a, a active active. A highly available ActiveMQ cluster. Uh, so when the message comes from the brokers, it hits that, and it goes out to our nodes. And uh, and I won't talk about exactly how many nodes we have, uh, but there's quite a quite a lot of them. And um, and from there, the uh, you know the nodes will talk back and forth through ActiveMQ, and uh, that uh, that is effectively what our production environment looks like. And, uh, and hopefully for anybody who's you know considering running this in-house themselves for on-premise PaaS uh, requirements or potentially for um, you know hosting another public PaaS, uh, PaaS such as uh, you know some of some of the members of, of the, the OpenShift Commons community and the OpenShift Origin community uh, have done, uh, which is great. Uh, you know, if you're considering those kinds of things, hopefully this will um, provide some amount of guideline of you know what what we have set up and how we handle uh, how, how we handle production scale, production scale load and those kinds of things. Um, so uh, at this point I'd like to take questions if there are any I uh, would be happy to answer them as I am able. All right well thank you so much Adam um, this that was great and a great overview of what's actually going on behind the scenes and like you said we have a, a couple of other um, folks that are using Cisco's doing some stuff with the inner cloud and hosting OpenShift online. Um, GetUp Cloud is another community member. So there's a lot of other people who are doing slightly different variations on this theme too. So we're um, going to put this slideshow up, but we'll also probably try and ask those folks to give us their configurations and their feedback and best practices as well. So thanks again, Adam, for your, your taking your time today, and we will put this up and make it available shortly for everybody. And if you have questions, feel free to post them on the IRC channel at OpenShift.
um, OpenShift or OpenShift Dev, and Adam Moore, one of the other members from the operations team, will um, make sure we, we get back to you as quickly as possible. And you can also post any questions you might have into the OpenShift um, Commons mailing list, and we'll make sure that they get directed to the correct technical resources. All right. Thanks again, Adam. Great. Thank you.